Thank you. 
If you have your Bible or your smartphone or, 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 or iPad or, or notebook, whatever it is that you have, or just look to the screen, they'll be up there. I want to give you last week's verses because there's going to be our primary verses through this, through this three, three-week series okay, on, on uh, uh, balance. And uh, I want to go over these. Uh, Matthew 6, 21 is the first one, all right? So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn there. And, and I promise you we're going to stay right in Matthew chapter 6, okay? We're going to add a verse this week. It's just going to be right there in Matthew chapter 6. So don't freak out because I don't usually do Bible drills, okay? Here's what the Bible says. Matthew, Jesus speaking. This is the Sermon on the Mount. You know why it's called a Sermon on the Mount? Because he preached it on the mountain, all right? It's that simple. For where your treasure is, anything that you value. Now, this, this balance is my stewardship campaign, okay? I do it every January but I want, to, I want you to understand that stewardship is more than just your money. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even want your money. What's he going to do with it, really, okay? He doesn't want your clothes. He can't wear them. He doesn't want your watch. He, he, he is time. He doesn't need to tell time, okay? All right, doesn't need your truck because he just don't need your truck, man. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's what he's after. You get it, right? You, now you do with me for sure. You get it. He's after your heart. He doesn't want your stuff. He wants your heart. Now, if he gets your heart... Well, you'll have easy time giving them your stuff, all right? Okay? Uh, matter of fact, I listened to Andy Stanley say this uh, in, in, in his series on the three laws of, of balance. He said this. He said, he and Sandra, his wife, they don't, they don't even buy anything without the mindset that they would let somebody else borrow it. Now, I, I'm a stingy guy, right? I'm not an only child, but I'm worse than an only child, all right? And, and so, but man, what a mindset to have that you, that you don't value the things of this world, okay? So, Here's our first verse. The second verse was Matthew 6, I believe verse 24. It'll be on the screen there. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money, things of this world. You, you can't. And every one of us, every one of us, you with me? Say amen. Every one of us war with that. You know, it, it was profound when Jesus said it, man. He's God in the flesh, so he knew, right? And, and, he, and he was fully man and fully God, so he understands the temptations that we face. But every one of us, we have warred, if not even this week, warred with struggling between the spiritual and the physical, all right? The meet the house payment, meet the car payment, meet the insurance, make sure groceries are bought, or do I give, and, and all this. And that's just that financial stuff, but also with our time and our talents. We, we all war with that, every one of us. Now, I'm at a place in my journey where it, it's a little bit easier for me to give. It doesn't mean that I don't still struggle and go, wait a minute, we're getting kind of low here, you know, uh, what's happening? I, 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 I think you need to keep up with where your money's going. That's last week's message. But, but here's where we war. We war with that. And, and let me just take just a moment to, 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 to do a little remedial about those, those two things. The first law of balance is having the proper reference point, okay? Now, this is not an original outline with me, but the meat to it is, is God has led me. I don't preach like anybody else, but I, I love this outline, and that's the three weeks, the three laws of balance. In the physical realm, we're going to bring them into the spiritual realm. That first one is you got to have the proper reference point. That proper reference point for us is God Almighty. See, remember, he's not after your stuff. He's after your heart. He wants your heart to be fixed on him, and then all the stuff is secondary, okay? And, and you don't flip out about stuff, okay? It, it, it's amazing. I mean, it is, it is amazing. And, I, and I, will, I mean, listen, I'm not so far removed from this or, or, or at a place where I'm going, oh, yeah, I got it made. Yeah, I'm great. Look at here. No, sometimes I've told you this. When I pull up at the red light and that big old truck is right beside my little old truck, you know, like when maybe Wes pulls up beside me in his big diesel, and, and I'm like, I mean, everybody wars with it, okay? All right? I mean, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I'm over all that, but, but here's the ultimate thing is that, man, I'm, I'm blessed to have what I have. At least I don't walk where I go, okay? I might leave a little smoke behind as I go, all right? Okay? At least it's not dust, all right, from my feet dragging, okay, or my butt dragging, all right? You, you see what I'm saying? It's about perspective and having that proper reference point. And that for us, that for us is God. I, I use the analogy, or I told you the story uh, that I learned. I was not a cheerleader. I was actually on the field playing during the game, not to knock the cheerleaders. And uh, they, they build a pyramid. I, I, I asked the right question. The, the, the gal that gets up on the very top up there, the way she stays balanced is they teach her to find something out in the distance, a, a stationary reference point that doesn't change, and fix your eyes on that. And it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. We, we have to fix our eyes on the proper reference point if we're going to stay balanced because it's so easy to get one way or the other, all right? So easy to drift one way or the other. And so he says, have that proper reference point, and, and, and you've got to find it, know it's God, and you've got to stay focused on it. 
And the reason we struggle, this is where we ended, the reason we struggle with staying focused, the problem with staying focused, is this thing called the law of harvest. The law of harvest. And the law of harvest, according to the Bible, is that we sow now and we reap what? Later. I'm glad you were listening or you're just that smart. Okay? You sow now and you reap later. It's not instant. Most of us live in an instant want world. I want it. I want it now. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty as anybody else. I want it now. Especially if I get my mind fixed on something, I want it now. And I, I don't care. Get out of my way. I want this now. Okay? And the reason we have a hard time staying focused is because of the law of harvest. It just doesn't happen right away. It, it takes time and season. And all of you will come into your season. Every one of you. It just takes time. You have to stay focused on that proper reference point. Now, I want to give you the verse that we're going to really key in on this morning. And it's Matthew 6, 33. Okay, Matthew 6, 33. Here's what it just jumped down a few verses. I love this verse. And when I was in college, I had to memorize all of this. Okay, all the Sermon on the Mount. I had to be able to cite it in front of the professors. Uh, uh, it, it, anyway, but... but uh, uh, Anyway, this was the one verse that stood out. Did you have to do that for a Did you have to, did you have to memorize? Uh, the, you know, anyway, I'm just saying this, this is really cool. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. Here's what he's talking about in a sermon. He's really talking about worry. And he's trying to tell his disciples, don't be like the Gentiles or those that don't believe. Don't worry about the clothes and food. And he talks about the birds and how you know, he takes care of them. And aren't they much more valuable? And, and isn't life more than just this stuff, you know? And, and so he begins to teach me. And he says this. He says, I need you to seek first the kingdom of God. All right? And so the second law of balance I want to talk to you this morning about is making constant corrections. Making constant corrections. You ever, you ever watch somebody or you yourself, you ever... You ever tried to walk a log across a creek, or, and it's, it's, it's creek where I'm from, not creek, okay? Uh, creek is what you get in your neck when you sleep wrong, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm just being real, okay? And, and so you ever tried to, to cross a creek on, on, on a fallen tree or something like that? Anybody, anybody ever, a balanced beam maybe? Anybody ever done the hell? Hi, yeah, okay, all right. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Billy, we were on a job site down there where you guys were putting the bridge in, and I, I, saw, I saw Heath. And he, reminded, he had no idea of the sermon, and, you know, I try to stay ahead, but he had no idea. But I wasn't going to do it, okay? You know what I'm saying? He, he, he's kind of crazy like that. There, there was this gas line that was run across that creek. And, uh, it, it, and so we were trying to be real careful, drop the trees, make sure to hit those things. But we need to get the other side. No bridge, all right? Bridge is gone. It's, hence why they're there. They're going to put the bridge back nice and new. And so I watched him as he, as he crossed over that, that, that gas pipe inside his casing. He he began to walk on that thing, and, 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 and you know, and he's got his, you know, he's got his, get some of his gear, and he's, and you, you get what I'm saying, right? I'm, I'm painting a picture for you, okay? Remember, I didn't look like this. He looked like this, okay? I look really cool, all right? I, I, I just walked through the creek, you know what I'm saying? No, I didn't. All right, I tried to. <laughs> and so he's trying to catch himself. I got to stay on task here. And so he's, he's and that's just like balance. It, it's making constant corrections. If you ever, if you've ever tried to balance something or yourself, you have to make constant corrections. That's just a part of it. And so we watched him. And, and so I, 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 we, I watched him, all right, which there was a lot of people there watching us. But as he walked across, and so he, I noticed he started to get, get, get kind of off. You, you, you with me? All right, a little more than he already is off. And so he's, he, he's not here today, so I can talk about him. And he's, he was kind of getting off, and, and so he had to stop. All right? And so I want you to keep that in mind when we talk about, in the physical realm, when we're trying to balance and keep everything balanced in our lives, as we walk this journey and struggle between the flesh and the spiritual. And I love this. I started to preach from this text. Paul says this, and I love it. Greatest statesman outside of Jesus Christ for the cause of Christ wrote most of the New Testament. I love the fact that he would say in Romans chapter 7, the things I know to do, I do not do. And the things I don't want to do, well, I, I, that's what I end up doing. I war with my flesh. Every one of us war with this balancing act from our money to everything that we do. All right? Everything that we do, because there is this need for constant correction. Now, watch this. You listening to me? Say amen. amen. I heard this, and I love this, uh, this, this point. And the reason we have a hard time financially in that arena, and sometimes overall spiritually, is because we don't see the effect immediately. And so I want to introduce you or remind you to what we call the po Pinocchio effect. Y'all all right? You see, it don't work that way. 
You see, every time Pinocchio told a lie, what happened? His e- what? I'm just kidding. His nose would grow. Every time he told a lie, his nose would grow. And so he knew, and everyone around him knew he was lying because his nose would grow. Now watch this. If every time you told a lie, your nose began to grow, you would stop lying. If every time you listen to something you shouldn't listen to, your ears begin to grow, you would stop listening to that, Dumbo. All right? If every time your eyes looked upon something that they are not supposed to look upon, they got bigger, you wouldn't look at that webpage anymore. You would not look at her at the mall anymore. You would go to the beach with blinders on, my friends, men. You wouldn't do it. If every time, every time, every time you said something you were not supposed to say, your lips grew, you wouldn't say that, right? So in that arena, and then with that in mind, it is easy to make constant corrections when there is immediate effect. Now, the problem is, in the spiritual realm, what we do now because of this law of harvest, to see how these sermons piggyback, please stay with me, all right? I know I'm a little crazy, but stay with me. Because of this law of harvest, that what I do now really don't show up till later, we, we sometimes find ourselves so far in debt are so far off course and so miserable in life that we don't have a clue how we got here or even how to get back because we don't see that immediate effect. And so I want to teach you this morning about how we are to make constant corrections even though we can't automatically see the result. Some of you have gotten so far off it has taken you years to get where you are and you think, you think, because you absolutely belittle God, You think that there is no hope for you and that there's no possibility of financial freedom or at a place where you can be free from the past or free from that bondage. When God said, I've come to set you free, Lazarus, come from the grave. I've come to set the dead alive. Our God is a supernatural God and operates with supernatural power. And so when we say we'll never get to that place, then we make God a liar because God said he cannot lie. And if he did it then, he will do it now if we will make the proper corrections. And I want to talk to you about being balanced and making constant corrections. The, the first thing that I want to talk to you about is that in this, this, this verse 633, when he says, seek, and I promise you, I, I got this Greek definition from the Greek dictionary, okay? All right, nobody else. When that word seek is there, it literally means to aim or to pursue or a desperate desire. And so as I desire, as I seek, as I, I learn the focal point, the proper reference point is God. Now, I'm just not going to stand still. I've got to get to the other side of the creek. So I've, I, I've got to balance myself because as I go through this life, man, there's a lot of temptation over here and there's a lot of temptation over here. And so to constantly correct because I get pulled this way and I get pulled this way, and I got to the proper reference point, I got to keep moving. I, I, every now and again, though, on this move, Okay, on this seeking, on this wanting God and wanting to live a righteous life, there has to be this awareness, first point, an awareness that I sometimes need to stop. The heat's working this week. That I need to stop. I told you, Heath, I, I, I watched him. I wasn't I wasn't going to dare try to balance because I would have fell in and then everybody would have laughed, okay? And I, I like to be people's jokes, but if I can avoid some things, I try to avoid them, okay? It's called discernment, all right? And so he's, he stopped and got himself gathered. In our lives, what we have a hard time doing, are you listening? It's just good preaching, I promise. We have a hard time stopping. We think if we stop, we'll die. We think if we stop, we'll lose it. If I don't keep doing this, they're going to leave me. If I don't keep acting this way, if I don't keep going there, if I don't keep this, this, and this. And, and what we need to be aware of is that every now and again to get back to balance, to make the cor- correct correction, all right, the constant cra- is that we need to stop. Stop what? Stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. I, I love this. Billy Sunday, whom I absolutely cannot wait to meet in heaven after I get done hanging out with Jesus for a million or so years. Billy Sunday said this. He said he defined an excuse as the, as the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Also, Benjamin Franklin wrote, I I never knew a man who was good at making excuses who was good at anything else. I never knew a man that was good at making excuses 
that was good at anything else. And see, the problem we have is that we've got to a place where we excuse everything. We've gotten so far removed from the truth of God that we even blame our daddy and our granddaddy that they didn't put the right amount of milk on our cornflakes. It's always somebody else's fault. Stop making an excuse. You got yourself out of balance. You chased the flesh, and I'm the first one to say, hey, I'm guilty of that. Paul said, the things I know to do, those are the things I don't do. I say what I shouldn't say. I look at what I shouldn't look at. I listen to what I shouldn't listen. Hey, you sometimes on this journey of this balancing act, all right, of keeping everything in the proper perspective, you got to stop a moment and stop making excuses. Always making an excuse. Everybody's got an excuse, and we avoid responsibility. Everybody wants somebody else to do it for them. I want you to understand that I am not taken away from the spiritual principle that it is Christ's life in you, the hope of glory, that you can't do anything on your own. But our God said, I've done it all. Go ahead and cross the river. I will go ahead and stop the flow. But when you get on the other side of the river, Joshua, tell your people, be ready, which are my people. You're going to have to fight. Some of you just quit fighting. You've just given up. You said, I'm so far gone. I've done so much. I, I, I've looked at it so long, I've talked about it so long, I've did it so long, I'm just going to keep on doing it. And every time you make an honest effort to get back balanced, you come up with a new excuse because you fall off the wagon. And what you need to do is stop, catch yourself, and quit making excuses. First step that, the first step to putting things in the right perspective and correcting them it's to admit, you listen to me, it's to admit our responsibility. I am responsible for me and no one else. You all right? That goes back to what I said before I begin to preach. I don't have to criticize. I don't, listen, I'm not, I don't even watch the news. You know that? I mean, I hate to admit it to you. I don't read the news. I don't watch the news. I don't even care that she shares the news with me because she's Charlene Gertz and she loves the weather. You know what I'm saying? School teacher thing there. If y'all remember Charlie Gertz, Char- anyway, all right. I just can't stand it. I can't stand to see it in my news feed on social media, all right? I, I, you say, well, you should keep up with America, and you should keep up. Listen, I, I'm keeping up with America by these 66 books right here. When it comes time for me to vote, I will vote those books and the principles that are found there, and nothing else, and nothing else. As far as all the bad and all the good, I do know one thing I like. I like the gas prices being as low as they are. I don't know why that's called, but I sure liked it the other day when it clicked, and I was like, what? It's already full? I like that. But I don't have to blame anybody else for anything. For I have in me the propensity to do all manners of evil. I am jealous. I am angry. I am selfish and self-centered. And I make no excuse for that. That is all on me. The problem you have and the reason you're so far out of balance is you keep blaming somebody else. Yes, they hurt you. Yes, they wronged you. Yes, they left you. Yes, they left you up a creek without the canoe even. But get over it. At least you still got air in your lungs, and as long as you have that, you have hope. And you have an opportunity to start afresh and anew. Oh, I know it's okay. It's okay. Have a pity party for a moment. That's, that's all right. I, I even bring, bring Doritos to mind. I do. I have them. I have them, all right? I, I mean, I go crazy. I, Coke, Z, Coke Zero, man. I go crazy. You know what I'm saying? I might even feel radical sometimes and, and get a Mountain Dew. You know what I'm saying? Woo! Watch out now. It's okay, but don't stay there. And what's crazy is most of us, you listening to me, most of the excuses we make, man, it's the second thing here I'm going to talk about. You got to stop and stop making excuses. Stop being selfish. Most, most, most things that we fuss over. Listen, I'm telling you, I've walked through the valley where families have buried their babies. I, I'm, I'm talking, listen, and you get tore up over the stupidest thing. You're stuck because you think daddy didn't lo- Listen, I've watched folks grow up without even knowing who their biological dad is. And to this day, they still don't know. And they are productive, absolutely awesome men and women of God. What is your excuse? You've got to stop being selfish and take responsibility. In doing so, in giving forgiveness where it is needed to be given, you do not excuse what he or she did to you. Nor do you make it right what you did. What you do is you limit and you take away the power that that other person has over you. And you give power where it is. And you go back to that first point. Give God praise in the house. And you have the proper reference point And you make the correct correction. Sometimes on this journey, if not more often than not, we've got to stop a moment. Quit making excuses. And ultimately, though they're very closely aligned, and stop being selfish. 
Do you remember Coy brought that, the, that, the team brought that soccer ball back from Rwanda? Do you remember that if you were here? What well, is just string and, 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 and the trash? I, and, I, and you say, well, that's Rwanda, man. Listen, I, I've, <laughs> I, I've been to West Virginia and watched the kids play in the sewage and think they were at the pool. I can go right down the street here and see a guy and hang out with him and nearly cannot stand beside him because he's so urine-soaked. I've been talking to a guy, he's homeless. Uh, I got introduced to him through B.J. Claren. I'm sure he has issues. But see, most of us, most of us, where we just pass him on by, he's another dope head or alcoholic, may be true. But what I see in him is potential. What I see in you is potential. All you got to do and all he has to do is stop making excuses and stop being selfish and seek first the kingdom of God. Don't worry about the clothes and the food and all those things. All that will be added once you have the right perspective. That's balance, man. I don't worry about the checkbook. Because I know in my house, we give God his first. And as long as we give God his first, he will never, ever let me and my daughters and even the dogs go without. Because he promised that. He promised that. Read chapter 6 in entirety out of Matthew's gospel. The birds do nothing. And yet I feed them. The lilies and flowers, they do nothing, they do nothing, yet they, they cover the ground with beauty. Aren't you much more important to God than that? Then would he give his life for you? Constant corrections. Means I gotta stop, I'm, 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 I'm out of control. Some of you are out of control, man. You're out of control in your spending. You're out of control in your temper. You're out of control in your selfishness. You're out of control in your excuses. And you need this morning to just stop. Catch yourself. Let God refocus you and regroup you. Some of you are out of balance in your marriage, and the only thing that will save your marriage, the only thing that will save your marriage is being balanced in Christ. It is easy to get out of balance. Believe it or not, Sandra and I have disagreements. All right? You don't believe that? Have you met her? You're always right, baby. That's right. Remember what I said earlier? Sometimes you just listen. Okay? And, 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 and can, I, can I be real and just share from our lives? Is that okay? Even as, even as, as recent as, as last night. I stuck my foot in my mouth. I really put both of them. It felt like I still had my boots on. <laughs> but let me tell you what happens. I'm being real serious here because you, you think, well, it's just about money. No, no, no. This is about life, man. This is balance. I was so far out of balance, though. She left out of the, the master bed. She left out of the bedroom. And uh, just me and the old dog, you know. And Junebug's cute, and I love her and everything. But uh, I'd rather little mama be there. You know what I'm saying? But let me tell you what happened. True story. I'd be doggone if I'm going to get out of this bed and go in there and tell her I'm sorry. Mm-mm. As a matter of fact... I was so selfish that I said as she was going out of the room, do you need your pillow and a blanket? Mm. True? True. You see how dumb we can get? <laughs> you love me and you can't do anything without me. And No, she didn't say a word. Ne- never met, uh, hence why God created her for me, never met a woman like her. She won't cuss me. She won't fuss at me. She won't raise her voice at me. She just knows how to work me. Just wait him out. Just wait him out. And so, so she finally come on back to bed only because she got a little cool in there on the couch. And I say all that to be a little bit facetious and just let you into our lives, but to say that we can get out of balance in every area of our life. I was so selfish. All I had to do was say, I'm sorry. What a big old dummy I am. Said something before I could think about it. And so I had to wait. And some of you going, oh, my God, you let the sun go down on your anger. <laughs> I knew we were cool when she come back to bed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I don't know what I got into at one. Balance. Balance. Constant, <laughs> constant corrections. 
Stop making excuses. Stop being selfish. Stop being selfish. It's so hard, though. You listen to me because I'm telling you, in the flesh, being selfish is our default mode. Because even in relationships, whatever your past is, you will default to that hurt. And you will try to hurt that other person that's not that person. Or you'll spend when you, you, you get it, right? It's every area of your life. Or you'll say, I'm not going back to that church. The preacher didn't speak to me like I thought he ought to speak to me. Music wasn't quite like I thought it ought to be. You all right? Heat, cool. You, you see what I'm saying? We, we make excuses and we're selfish and we get out of balance. And it's, it's hard to battle if you don't have the proper reference point. Because our default mode will always be the flesh. Let, 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 me, let me go on and, 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 and try to sum this up so making constant corrections if you if you're trying if you're trying to follow me with an outline the, the first step in that second law of balance is that there has to has to be an awareness that you're getting out of balance and in that awareness that you're getting out of balance you stop gather yourself in christ and then move on now i want to give you Two things that you need to constantly ask yourself that will keep you in check. All right? You with me? I think these are two questions that you can ask on a constant basis that will keep you in check and help you make the right corrections. The first one is this. They're really simple. Are we active in the right things? Are we active in the right things? 633 says, seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, which means doing it a right way for the right reason. Then all these things shall be added. So let let me ask you about this correction in your life. The starting point is sometimes you have to stop, gather yourself, quit making excuses, quit being selfish, and ask yourself these questions. First one, am I doing or involved in the right things you see it's so easy for us to get busy just being busy it's easy and we can really excuse it away that we're doing god's work when we're neglecting our family i i uh i'm amazed at how so many of us put so many things before our family and yet we use our family as the excuse the reason we put that before our family they don't need all that stuff I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, didn't even, I didn't even plan to say this, but the Spirit's leaving there. We, we literally, and I know you saw it on social network because we share our lives with you guys, at least most of it. There's a few doors that are closed, uh, rightfully so. We just, we just love to go to thrift stores. I, we, we, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a yard sale kind of guy, okay? Not judging that. I just, I'm not a yard sale. I'm not going to pick through your stuff. And uh, I'm just not going to do that, okay? But, but we, we, there's this really cool store down in Anderson, old, old downtown Anderson, Habitat Humanity. It's, it's just really cool. So it's a double blessing. I mean, I spend all day in there. I can see shutters and windows, and I see, I eat toilets. I mean, I just, I just you know, what we could do with all this stuff. And, and so yesterday, and you saw, we, we, we found a little, we've been looking for a desk for Lana in her room, you know, trying to make sure, because she loves to write. She's so creative and artsy and just all that good stuff. And we want to make sure we, as parents, we foster everything that she's, she's trying to do. $10 for this little metal desk, rusty and dented and all this good stuff. And so we put a little love in it, made it. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, four or five times, just when I tucked her in and went in to have prayer with her, did she say, I love my desk. Thank you. $10 and a couple cans of black spray paint, some chrome polish, and a piece of sandpaper. You see, it's, 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 it's amazing to me how we put so many things ahead of our family and we use our family as an excuse to be selfish. Am I doing the right thing for the right reason? You need to ask yourself when you go to those places, wherever those places are, when you put your boots on in the morning and you start out the door, am I doing the right thing for the right reason? Second question you need to ask yourself to keep you in constant correction and balanced on this journey is not only ask, am I doing the right things, but am I doing it to glorify God? Man, what a a scary thought 
to know that some of the things, even like putting my feet in my mouth last night, did not glorify God. It did not honor the institution of marriage and the sacredness of that intimacy. To imagine the things that I think about, the things that I listen to, the things that I see, the things that I talk about, the things that I waste my time and resources on, do they actually glorify God? Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with having nice things. We've already covered that. I'm not saying that at all. I, 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 listen, I love my big TV, all right? As a matter of fact, I keep looking at it, and I think I can get about four or five more inches in this room, all right? I'm just saying. I just got to wait a little bit so that she'll be okay with it, all right? We need to put that one downstairs or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. So I'm not saying, and I do, want, I do want mama to have a new car. Okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that. We need third row. We, I mean, I, I get, I'm not, please don't hear me wrong. But everything that you do and buy and go and give and, and use, does it glorify God? Because he said the reason he saved you your whole existence in this world as a Christian, if you, if you don't care or say, I don't have nothing to do with God and nothing to do with Christianity, I, I don't care, listen, then this is not for you. But if you call yourself a Christian, if you say that I'm a believer, if you've ever involved God in anything that you've ever done, like God help me sell this house or help me not do this, well, you've already crossed that line, okay? If you call yourself a Christian then you ought to care about everything that you do, every word that you say, every thought that you have, because he says, bring captive every thought when he wrote the church at Corinth. He says that everything that you do, even though everything is permissible, not all things are beneficial. It's what I'm doing, glorifying God. My team can tell you, our team can tell you that I pray every Sunday right here or there or there or wherever with my team, and I say this, I want everything that we say and do for you to be honored in God. I don't care if it's the biggest screw up. I don't care if wires go and fly everywhere. I don't care if it's a song you like. I don't care if I'm too loud for you or too soft for you. I want God to be glorified in everything that I do. The way I raise my kids. The way I love my wife. The way I serve you and visit the sick and the shut in. The way I saw a tree down. I want you to be glorified in that. That will help you stay Constantly corrected and balanced. Everything that you do, everything that you do, everything that you do, every sport your kid is involved in, is it bringing glory to God? Every dime that you spend, is it bringing glory to God? And for the most of us, we'd say, no. But that's why God sends preachers like me. that will just be real enough to tell you, I haven't got it all figured out just yet. But I want it. I want God to be glorified so strong in my life now than any other time. I'm, and I'm not slacking off on any other church I ever pastored, any mission trip, any country, any state, any city I've ever served. I want it now more than any other time in my life because I understand a little bit better how important it is that everything I do, because this moment could be my last, glorifies God. Am I involved in the right activities, kids? It's what I post or the pictures I put up. Well, do they glorify God? The little huddle that I get into to gossip and talk. But talking about other churches. You know that it's one bride, right? Many different locations with many different styles. But it's one bride, okay? We are not in competition, all right? Does it glorify God? When you sing, does it glorify God? When you do administrative stuff and you lead people and you clean up, throw up, does it glorify God? And you say, that's the silliest and dumbest thing. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, I do everything as unto the Lord and not unto man. You better learn your scripture. And on my job, on my lunch break with my girlfriends, not me, I'm just referencing you. <laughs> I got one girlfriend, you know what I'm saying? I married her. My love, baby. Sugar lump lump. Okay. You see the kids down here like, <laughs> does it glorify God? When I'm at the ball game, 
You're right. Have I, have I, I've made my point, right? I can, I can quit going like this, right? <laughs> Two questions to ask. Simple. Am I involved in the right activities for the right reasons? And what I'm doing, does it glorify God? And let me tell you something. On this journey I've learned, there's some things that I have to do that are tough. And I'll be honest with you, and I know there's kids in here, but you know me, I just tell you, they suck. They just absolutely suck. I, I don't get up in the morning and go, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this. There are things that we have to do in this life that I'm telling you are tough, but they're the right things to do, and they glorify God. And he's honored in them. And he says, if you will humble yourself before me, I will exalt you before men. Am I involved in the right activities? And is God glorified? Lastly, acceptance, asking the right questions, constant corrections involves acceptance. Not in the acceptance of failure, but in the acceptance of these two things. Mercy and grace. Do you remember last week I ended the sermon and, and got real boisterous and in the spirit about how Psalm 23, like if you, find a re- if you find the proper reference point, which is God, it will give you great courage. It will move you forward. It will, it will cause you to stand. I'm talking about strong when all hell breaks loose. And, and, and I quoted Psalm 23 because even in the darkest of his, his times, I love how he ends that. He said, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I heard one commentator say, I think it was Max Lucado that that wrote this years ago. I read a book, uh, Traveling Lightly, I believe it's where he said this. I could be wrong about this, but I I do remember reading. He said that goodness and mercy were like the two sheepdog. They were always nipping at the the pack of sheep to keep them in line, to keep them headed the right direction. Can I just stretch just a little bit? I'm not adding to or taking away. Isn't the goodness of God really the grace of God? And his mercy, let, let, let me, let's end with this and, and say, hey, if you're out of balance, why don't, you just, why don't you just be aware, okay? Ask those questions, and most of you already have, and you know what you're guilty of, okay? And that's not for me to judge or anything like that. But why don't you just, before we leave this place, accept his goodness and his mercy, his grace and his mercy. Let me, let me remind you what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting is not getting what we deserve, namely the punishment for our sin. Isn't it amazing? Can you can just stop for a moment and think about if you had if you would have kept down that road, how bad it looked? I mean, listen, I've, I've walked away from things and, and looked back on them and still pray for them, but going, thank God I'm not in that. You see that that's that's part of the mercy of God. He's a merciful God. He doesn't give us what we really deserve. What we really deserve is hell. None of us deserve heaven. None of us. You all right? There's none righteous, no, not one. You can do nothing to save yourself. Paul wrote the church at Ephesus and he said, it is not of works, at least any man or woman should boast. It is absolutely the grace of God, the mercy of God, not getting what we really deserve. You know how far out of balance you are? You know how many times you should have already bellied up? But see, the mercy of God has still got you here this morning. And all you got to do is accept that. You don't have to listen to that voice that says you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you suck, you, you, you've messed up, you, you, you've made a mess of it. I sit at the edge of Tony Morales' bed at Anderson just a few weeks ago and literally he was just at death's door and he struggled with his past. He struggled with the mistakes that he had made and he, 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 just, he could not understand that what he had got in his salvation, that it was real and all the mistakes and all the people that he had hurt. And I'm telling you, I reassured him and we had a great conversation and he accepted and he understood. It's not that he didn't love God. It wasn't that he wasn't saved. But most of the time we have a hard time accepting God's mercy and his grace. Grace is, listen, if mercy is not getting what we deserve, grace is getting, <laughs> is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is his unmerited favor. Did you know it's mentioned 150 times in the New Testament, grace? Did you know that every letter Paul writes, that he alludes to it at the beginning of his letter and the end of his letter? You know why I believe that with all my heart? Not only did God inspire him to do that, but he was a guy that had persecuted, that had killed or been a part of the murder of Christians He was a guy that had had so much in his life that had been forgiven and mercy applied to that he couldn't help get over and he never really got over. And the thorn in his side and God told him, my grace is sufficient. 
that you don't have to worry about that. You just absolutely every day get up, get the right focus point, stay focused on me, and constantly make corrections. Are you doing the right thing for the right reasons? And does it glorify God? And if it does, then accept His mercy and accept His grace and be set free and run down that balance beam for God Almighty. That is our God. And so I don't know who of you here this morning desires to be blessed. You understand? And you say, wait a minute, you a faith preacher? I'm a faith preacher. Yes. You can say I'm a name and claim it if you want to. I don't really consider myself that, but I, I want you to understand something. That the Bible says all I have to do is ask. <laughs> I've been talking about to get in the jet, okay, all right? Let's, let's don't go there. I'm talking about his mercy and his grace. Some of you have made a royal mess of things. I go one finger this way and three back this way, okay? And I shared you a little bit of mine, all right? It's a daily battle. Me and my big mouth and selfish pride and jealousy and can't let go of the past. And I don't need to go on, but you understand. And see that constant correction, that getting balanced. I mean, tackling 2015 because it's going to be your year. It's our year at one. Well, it begins with the right reference point. That's God. Stay focused. The corrections that need to be made start with the questions and an awareness that you need to ask those questions. But once you ask them, and the devil begins to flood your mind and soul with all the bad things, you don't need to accept that. You need to accept the grace and the mercy. The sheepdogs that will follow you all of your life to keep you in line. You see, you can't go back and start over. You know that, right? None of us, I wish, I, I've told Sandra a million times, if I could go back and start, I'd have every experience be with her. I'd have everything, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Now listen, I, don't, I, I wouldn't change a thing in the journey, but you get the, the heart of that, right? It's impossible to do that. That's why I asked her to marry me on the 50-yard line in Death Valley. Because I believe we've come 50 yards, and we had 50 more yards to go to complete the field. Plus, we love them tigers, all right? You see, you can't go back, but you can start right now fresh and anew, and it can be a great ending to what started out as a terrible story. You all right? All you got to do is accept. Stand to your feet, please. Pray with me.